So welcome to a breakout session 2A on biophysical aspect. Uh, we will have three uh, panelists uh, by name of Pak Gusti Anzari and then um, Muhammad Taufik. Are you there, Pak Taufik? Yes. Good. And then uh, last one is Pak Solihin Manuri. Are you there, Pak Solihin? Here, yeah, Pak Daniel. Good, thank you. And then uh, we will have a discussion. Uh, you met uh, Mark Reed. Mark, are you there? Mark is not there. So I would like to ask Aditya, my our uh, reporter, to call uh, Vito to migrate Mark to the room, please, Adit. Mark had difficulties. Okay, we have more people now. So it's not fair for Mark if we start now. <laughs> you will be discussing what uh, our three panelists will be saying and uh, hopefully we will have Mark very soon. Mark, are you there? Pak, Dan, Pak Daniel, yes. Mark from the chat, I see the Mark said he was in room 2D. Maybe he, he got the wrong room. <laughs> okay, Adit, can you tell Vito to migrate Mark Reed with our discussion for 2A from 2D, please? Okay, but I will tell Vito. Thank you. This is important to have Mark here because um, his point is very critical when he presented in the plenary. I think it was very valid kind of cautionary, as uh, Adam said, uh, to, to think about when we are trying to pick uh, the criteria and indicator and even when we are verifying them, when we are measuring them, and it's very important that critical point should be uh, taken care of. Do you have him in eye? No, he's not here yet. So we lost 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, well, we better make a start. Uh, if uh, I may, I would like to ask pa Gusti to start with. Pa Gusti, what, what do you think about this business of restoration from your perspective? Uh, do you want to, to share a slide or do you want to just say whatever you want to say uh, with regard to you know restoration? or restoring pitland from your perspective and, and also what do you think about the criteria and indicator uh, from your work? I know you've been working a lot on the yeah. ecology of pitland and uh, that's been very prolific uh, work you, you've been doing on carbon, on um, vegetation cover, etc. But just see. Thank you, pa Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I share a, a two or three slides? Yeah. Okay, I'll play sharing now. But you only have five minutes, okay, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Okay, this is uh, uh, the title that I got. Uh, carbon Dynamics, Consideration for Effective Restoration. 
So first of all, we need to. Why it doesn't work? Okay. Uh, Thank what... you, Mark, for joining. All right. So, what is a pit carbon, right? As, as we as we know, a pit carbon is organic carbon preserved in pit soil or histosols, but Indonesia call it organosols. So, pit carbon is slowly decomposed under a water lock environment. But you can see uh, the problem, deforestation, drainage, and fire are key factors that cause rapid decomposition of pit carbon in histosol. So pit carbon accumulation is a, a balance. The rate of pit oxidation should be lower than the rate of organic matter in, uh, in flux, right? So we have the pit carbon uh, counting, carbon stock, just a... Uh, a product of bulk density, percentage of TOC, pit depth, and uh, you can see you can uh, you can calculate by ton carbon per hectare or other units. So we so very important to bulk density, uh, pit depth, and then uh, carbon uh, concentration. Okay, let's see. I I suggest to have one a principal one. Collecting adequate baseline data of high carbon stock in histosol or organosol. So like uh, Mark just presented uh, today. So uh, criteria, the first criteria is let users monitor and record either pit thickness or pit subsidence. So indicator, uh, we have two here, a minimum yearly record of pit thickness in sample plot or be a minimum yearly record of pit subsidence based on subsidence uh, pole plot. So as you know, uh, mostly uh, uh, pit, pit land area is very remote, it's not controlled. So it's, sometimes it's very hard to install a, a subsidence pole, but you can go uh, do repeat the measurement, repeat the pit thickness and pit properties in, if you have the GPS uh, coordinates. And second criteria, then user measure bulk density, organic matter, and total organic carbon. So like um, Mark says, the indicator of time series of bulk density, organic matter, and total organic carbon data are available. And I move on to the principle two. So we need carbon emission prevention. So this one can be mostly more uh, about management. Then user practice a good water management scheme. So indicator, high groundwater table, less than 40 centimeter is maintained all year. Drainage canal is properly maintained if there is for the cultivated uh, pitland area. And no drainage is newly uh, constructed. Uh, second criteria, let owners prevent and control feed fire. So an early fire system warning is well implemented. And also active management of fire prevention, training and control. And uh, criteria number third, use of pit does not deplete high carbon stock. It's more scientific, this one maybe, about the data. So the rate of pit subsidence is minimal, maybe less than two centimeters per year, but you can debate on this. But the city in pit surface, 50 to 150 centimeters. This is what we call it a crowd term. The oxidative pit does not significantly increase or indicate pit compaction. So the value maybe bulk density should be less than 0 0.12 gram per centimeter cubic and organic matter values uh, should be more than 90% and TOC value should be more than 45%. TOC and total nitrogen, nitrogen ratio should be more than 40. I think that's all my uh, idea. Okay. Me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Gusti. This is uh, very quantitative, very academic, and um, certainly they are, to some extent, uh, miserable. So yeah. um, let's move to our second panel, uh, Pak Solihin. Oh, sorry, Pak Taufik. Thanks, Pak Daniel. I will share my screen, okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks for the time. Uh, I will uh, discuss about hydrology important for uh, peatland. Uh, as you know, 
that hydrology is uh, one of important criteria for uh, peat decomposition. And uh, we can say like uh, water table or canal water level, and also uh, distribution of soil moisture uh, will uh, give information on drainage, uh, either in a local or spatial scale in different season. And the last is hydro. I will I will I would say that hydro regime also control fire susceptibility. Uh, this graph is uh, about. Uh, our work with PRG about the soil moisture distribution during dry season uh, and wet season. We can compare uh, here 2019 uh, and uh, uh, in dry season and wet season in uh, 2020. This is uh, overview of soil moisture in different uh, part of uh, peatland in Kalimantan and in Sumatra, just for an overview. And the second, uh, my presentation is uh, I will propose uh, some indicator uh, relating to hydrology. Uh, previous speaker, Pa uh, Gusti, uh, focus on annual uh, annual value for, for instance, in the water table. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, I will uh, propose to have seasonal indicator such as uh, water table either in dry season or in wet season. It should be different because, uh, we, we, as we know, that in uh, what uh, in rainy season, uh, the water table always close to the surface. But uh, for the dry season, it may be uh, almost a uh, hundred meter. Centimeters. This, yeah, yeah, hundred centimeter. Okay, it, it's also work for canal water level. Uh, in, in canal water level, also uh, influence the uh, dynamics of water table. Also, I would say that soil moisture. Uh, will be uh, useful for uh, uh, to 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 analyze the effectiveness of uh, pit restoration. But I think uh, the soil moisture is maybe not practical because uh, we need a special training for uh, for fisher of a villager uh, in the field because it's not uh, that quite easy uh, like a water table measurement. And the last. Uh, we can say that uh, we also need to know how many percent of fire susceptibility either in uh, dry season or in uh, rainy season because uh, if we know uh, the higher higher fire susceptibility for for instance forty percent or thirty percent uh, and we compare uh, baseline year and uh, for example in the next year we can say. Uh, with either uh, our uh, restoration success or not. Uh, the last uh, is th this graph is about uh, our our work with BRG about fire sustainability in in uh, dry season and in uh, uh, rainy season uh, in 2019. Just an example: uh, the distribution of extreme uh, fire sustainability, and in 2020. Also, uh, a lot of uh, uh, what is it? Uh, safe fire danger level here. Okay, that's all, Pat Daniel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat Tofik. So I think you address what Mark was curious about. This is the the dynamic, the temporal kind of change, and you you mentioned very um, strongly about the importance of seasonality. Let's move to our third, our final panel, uh, uh, Solikin. Thank you, Pak Daniel. Uh, let me share my screen. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, peatland fire assessment uh, uh, related with this uh, CNI approach. So uh, I agree to the previous uh, presenter uh, that you know the CNI approach is very effective too for peatland. Uh, restoration monitoring and it can uh, provide comprehensive understanding on degraded peatlands that need to be restored and also you know uh, to understand whether this uh, peatlands is already restored or not so this uh, related with the fire uh, occurrence uh, yeah uh, it also mentions that it's one of the important indicators or criteria uh, that is uh, related with the peatland restoration. So fire occurrence is, uh, uh, you know, normally related with uh, degraded peatlands because degraded peatlands are often uh, drained through canal development, which leads to dry peatlands. 
and drier peatlands, of course, uh, are susceptible to, to fire. And also the, the uh, recurrent fires uh, normally indicate the severe uh, degradation of peatlands. And uh, yeah, as a part of the burn areas and also recurrent fires, I think uh, burn depth is also very useful uh, indicator of uh, peatland uh, restoration monitoring. So uh, yeah, I, I try to put this uh, principle uh, of uh, peatland restoration as uh, that peatlands are sufficiently wet and covered with primary vegetation or sustainable communities, depending on, depending on the ecosystem function and land use type. Because uh, uh, if, you know, in, in, in Indonesia, we have uh, different types of uh, uh, peatland ecosystem. One is for protection or conservation, and the other one is for uh, uh, agriculture. So this is something that uh, uh, these principles should be should be met. So not only focusing on the on the uh, on the uh, uh, conservations, but for conservation, let's say uh, the primary vegetation is is uh, the, the 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 main principle. And for the criteria, uh, I think uh, we all agree that uh, water level it should be uh, at certain height. So I think the previous uh, presenters already mentioned the numbers, but uh, again, this is uh, will uh, depends on the on the uh, land use types, and also with less variations, uh, uh, especially during dry season and wet season. And this will reduce uh, emissions from uh, pit decomposition. And then the fire occurrence is reduced, uh, burn area is reduced, uh, in particular during prolonged dry seasons, because this is where, when the, the, the fire season are become uh, very, very uh, severe. And then uh, the, the next criteria is, uh, the three species, there is uh, the abundance of natural and climax uh, three species uh, are available in, in the area. And for indicators, I really agree with the uh, points that are suggested by, by Mark, uh, the four things that uh, could go wrong that, uh, yeah, we, we don't use a single indicators and also with, uh, without context. I think this is something that uh, 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 we, we, we really need to be, you know, uh, use this, uh, these points uh, when developing the indicators. So I think water level is uh, certainly a measure uh, at canal and pitlands, but certainly for uh, data without, uh, would be, you know, the, uh, the context would be, you could be uh, spatially representative. This is something that uh, right now we have limitations, but thanks to the remote sensing uh, technology that uh, also previously uh, mentioned by Pa Budi that uh, FAO has uh, developed this uh, research, uh, uh, you know, uh, making relationship between uh, remote sensing data with the ground data, and and it seems really promising. So really hope that we can use this technology and later on can uh, apply to a uh, uh, wider area. And also number of fires, frequency of fires, size of the burn area and also burn depth can be the indicators as well. And this is something that you can easily measure, uh, uh, especially using remote sensing. So remote sensing will provide you uh, a data with uh, context. Yeah? So this is really crucial so that you have a really uh, comprehensive and uh, spatially uh, uh, representative data. And then emissions level due to decompositions and fires also can be uh, used as the indicators. Uh, and the, the last one was the number of uh, species and also proportions of uh, climax species, pioneer species, and also fire uh, climax species. I think that's all uh, my my uh, comment. Thank you, Pak Daniel. Thank you, Pak Solihin. Thank you very much. And it's very comprehensive. You you touch also upon fire, which is uh, often 
very sensitive, um, but local uh, people are also concerned about it. And we certainly need to engage also social uh, people uh, aspect on, on this that we certainly have no, uh, no uh, clue how to do that in, in this particular breakout group. We, we will see how we can compare our notes with the social uh, group. So Mark, I would like to invite you to uh, comment or discuss what they've been explaining uh, from uh, their perspective. Uh, Gusti is an ecologist working on carbon a lot. Uh, Solihin is working also on carbon, but mostly remote sensing. And we believe that this technology is as usable and applicable and Taufik is very much on the hydrology, water, uh, water balance, and, and also seasonality of the case. Your comment, Mark. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to make two comments and uh, bring a question to you for each of these two comments. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the first one is going we to have, be- We have 10 minutes for this before okay. we give it first, the uh, floor to the audience. Good. So the first one, accuracy and ease of use. And uh, I'm going to give you a link to a paper that provides you with criteria for evaluating indicators uh, from the literature. Um, and, um, and uh, among these, under the category of accuracy, is this idea of reliability. And, uh, and something that Mouf pull out, uh, pulled out uh, about seasonality here. Uh, so uh, I may have an indicator which I think is highly reliable, but um, it turns out that the data I get is not reliable because it turns out people are using that indicator in the wrong season or in the wrong habitat or peak type, etc. So it can be that certain indicators are only relevant, they will only give you reliable uh, data in a certain location or habitat or system or at a certain, uh, certain time. Uh, and then uh, we've got this trade-off to the ease of use uh, as well. So we have a, a number of very uh, reliable, accurate scientific indicators in, the, in all of the talks, in, in fact. Uh, and uh, my question is, which of these scientific indicators do we think might also be able to be measured by local communities and get some of those benefits uh, of doing so? And how can you design local data collection in such a way that you get as reliable as possible data that might then be integrated with a scientific monitoring program? What are your thoughts? Who want to start? Topic? Uh, Okay, uh, thanks, Makrit. Uh, okay, uh, I, I already uh, said that about the cell measure, it's maybe not practicable because uh, it is need a special training for local people or, and also need uh, not a uh, rather expensive uh, instrument. But for canal, but for water level, uh, water table in the field, it is quite easy to measure uh, with. Uh, 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 a rope or, or or stick. It's it's very easy to measure, and also uh, the canal water level also easy, like the water table. And for fire susceptibility, uh, we need uh, information on rainfall and also water table. It it also quite easy to measure uh, by the local people, but we need a uh, 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 a simple calculation on that. So that's my comment. Okay, good. Christy or of our solicit, you want to respond? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a, a good response. Uh, very credible. These are things that could be measured. We need to, to have clear protocols, etc. Uh, I wonder if anyone else wants to pull out indicators from the talks that they thought are um, easily enough measurable by communities or where there are proxies that can be used by communities that might still provide us with useful information, but also how you go about designing those kinds of programs so that you can actually integrate the local and the scientific knowledge. Uh, Mark, according to my experience, measuring a pit thickness uh, usually assisted by the local communities. So they learn a lot. They learn uh, easily how to to measure the pit thickness if we provide them the 
shot training and also the device. I mean the pin auger, uh, proper pin auger. So they 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 know very quickly. I think how to do that. Yeah. So I'm sure that they could measure pit pit thickness if we the if they have the the equipment and we have the our connection. Yeah. Uh, for for the pit line in this case, yeah. Because we we measure pit thickness before before using the uh, a program of uh, REDD, yeah. So uh, the local communities are wonder why we 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 measure the pit. So it's hard to to blame uh, to 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 teach them about the carbon stock, but then but they easy to uh, how to to measure the thickness of the pit is easy for them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Also have to collect Thank you. Sample also, also. Okay. There is also an appreciation from the floor that um, clustering the water content or soil moisture seasonally or seasonality reduce the uh, uncertainty or reduce or improve the accuracy. They they appreciate that. It's from Lapan, the uh, agency for aeronautics, Pak Dede. Thank you. Just want to recognize that. Solihin, you want to add or respond yes. on Mark? Yes, yes Mark. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark. So related with the uh, 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 indicators that can be measured by, by locals, I think uh, my previous colleague already mentioned about several indicators, but I think I also want to uh, 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 yeah, express that uh, relying on uh, you know, only to community on collecting data, it's also not uh, really sufficient because, uh, yeah, sometimes like uh, remote sensing uh, data uh, or, or, or some indicators are required a uh, wide range of spatial uh, uh, distribution. So it requires uh, uh, technology to do it. And local community may, uh, may involve in, in the, you know, like, validations of uh, the data so that uh, can be combination between uh, local knowledge and also uh, technology and also uh, related with the accuracy uh, yeah our limitation is of course uh, uh, sometimes uh, related with the, the cost and also availability of the data that we can use but uh, certainly uh, when we understand about the you know the characteristic like like seasonal seasonability, seasonality, and also uh, uh, different different uh, uh, class of bulk density, for example, that can reduce the uncertainty of the estimates. So, for example, for estimating the pit fires, uh, we we include the you know, El Nino and uh, EOD, for example, as the extreme year and also non-extreme year. So that's something that can reduce the uncertainty. I think that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Solihin. Um, Mark, do you have another round of concern or comment after comparing that uh, yeah. or trade-off between reliability and accuracy? So um, I've just put in the chat um, three things of many things that you might want to try and do. Um, uh, an, an example also of a citizen science initiative in the UK. Uh, so you can read more about that there, but I'd like to put another question to our panelists and to the broader group. So listening to the conversations, I hear a, a hierarchy, an implicit hierarchy, uh, where the majority of the indicators people suggested were hydrological, followed by climatic, followed by biodiversity. I think only Solikin um, provided us with uh, a biodiversity indicator. Um, although this was implicit, I wonder whether actually explicitly we agree that uh, that there is a hierarchy and that uh, that hydrological indicators are the most important, followed by climatic, and that biodiversity indicators are perhaps less important, and that if we were to have um, uh, that it's, if we if there was to be a bias in terms of the number of indicators that we measure. Uh, we might be happy having a bias towards more hydrological indicators than anything else. Comment? Of course, my thing is the best thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, it's very natural, isn't it? It's, it's 
nothing wrong. I imagine uh, if you feel like you are expert or know this better, you you would like to propose this before everybody else doing that. But uh, feel free to to comment on Mark uh, concern about hierarchy. Is it is hydrology really the prime principle so that it has to be higher up in the layer in the in the ladder? Uh, but Daniel, it's very hard to answer this. I think uh, mm -hmm. it's not that simple. But I think that uh, the most important uh, we need to 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 uh, to, to, des to design or to to ensure that the uh, micro uh, climate of the pit degradation is suitable for uh, for restoration. I mean, I mean, if we just uh, improve uh, water, the water, the water structure, but without, without uh, considering uh, vegetation, I think the result is not is not achievable. Yeah, because we need also to ensure the uh, vegetation will be uh, growing back to the area. That's why we need to. Also to, to to support the pioneer species maybe to to improve the land cover first, and slowly the the hydrological will be improved also I think, yeah. <laughs> These are I, I think at this moment from my experience in the field. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I saw, I'm sorry, it's a hard question. <laughs> it is a question, but, but you know, if you just improve the hydrological, you cannot maintain the water during the dry season, as you know, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Because it's so very reaction. important to, 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 to restore the water. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, we, like Hans Justin already mentioned, we need to keep the uh, peatland moist. Yeah. So, so soil moisture is very important in order to to for regrowing the vegetation. Yeah, even so it's, pioneer species. Yeah. So it's like chicken and egg, isn't it? When yeah. you are talking about water <laughs> and vegetation. No, no. But but it's important you mention about the pioneer uh, characteristic character yes. here. So unless you are pioneering, you won't be able to survive if the water is limited. That's that's important. Yeah. Keywords, the pioneer. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mark, um, this is my question to you. Uh, when you are thinking about hierarchy, do you think at the end of the day we have to make that anyway? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think the... I guess the challenge is that uh, it depends on who is asking the question. So uh, right. if I'm a policymaker and <laughs> I care about the zero targets, I'm going to care about the climatic indicators. Uh, if I'm a conservation charity, perhaps I care more about the biodiversity indicators. Right. Um, and uh, and of course, the the more diverse our indicators, the more holistic our assessment can be. So clearly, it's important. We have uh, a mixture of all three, uh, but uh, but if uh, if there is going to be uh, an imbalance, um, then certainly with the um, uh, certain in terms of the, the absolute number of indicators, um, when you look at the work that we've done um, to create core outcome sets, uh, the biodiversity sets uh, are the ones that uh, that we see uh, as the shortest lists uh, typically. Um, uh, similar lengths of lists for climatic and, uh, and hydrological. But I take the points that, uh, that everyone is making, that the hydrology is what is driving very often the greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and the biodiversity. And so um, uh, if you had to, um, to prioritise uh, and if you wanted to justify having more indicators in any of one of those, then I would argue that perhaps hydrology is where you might uh, be able to overinvest. Yeah, thank you. I think Hans Houston in the floor has something to offer with regard to climate and hydrology. Do you want to say something, Hans? Hans Houston is yeah. from Germany. You yes. can go. 
I, I, I can tell a little bit about that. Uh, we see in the chats already discussions and also in the presentation about this indicator less than 40 centimeter below. Uh, first, the question is always below what? Uh, a, 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 a relative indicator doesn't say anything without stating the reference. And we all know what the problem is. Uh, in, a, in a pristine uh, peat swamp forest, it is difficult to define this zero level. But it is not difficult in a drained and degraded peatland, because that is then the place where you are walking. Uh, so if you are in a burnt uh, peatland with, with ferns on it, uh, the surface is clearly the surface of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, on top where you walk and if you formulate then that the water level should be higher than minus 40 you are sure that you are going to lose substantial amounts of peat and maintain substantial emissions and because peat oxidizes as soon as it is not completely water saturated and that simply means uh, that if the water level is one centimeter below that surface uh, the peat is oxidizing so the only uh, indicator, if your goal is that you want to stop emissions and stop subsidence, is that your uh, goal have to be uh, uh, zero water level in average. Uh, but that simply means uh, that in the wet season, the water level must be over the surface. Otherwise, you cannot keep it uh, from uh, falling deep below the surface in the dry season. And that is the big problem. Of course, this 40 centimeters, and, and Gusty said it already, uh, this is a political choice. Uh, this political choice can be accepted uh, because it would mean that if you come from minus 80 to minus 40, that you halve the emissions. And that is already a, a, a goal. But we should not uh, try to, 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 to say that with minus 40, the world is uh, 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 good. Uh, that, is, that is the problem. Uh, so <laughs> we are here in a, a group that talks about biophysics and we should not talk about political indicators and we <laughs> should talk about indicators that are biophysical for the goals that we want to reach and that is the minimizing of emissions and the stopping of subsidence and then okay. minus 40 is not a good indicator. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much Hans. So the bottom line or the keywords here is the reference. Uh, to what extent or to which level are you referring this number? Uh, that's that's very crucial, I guess. Um, no, I would like to invite those who are talking about or expressing their concern about vegetation. Can I have Ibu Hesti? You can capture your writing there in the chat, but I would like to have a live interaction. Are you still there? Hesti? Yes, hello, I'm here. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a question. It's really a comment uh, for, uh, for uh, solicitation uh, criteria indicator for the uh, 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 biodiversity. And I appreciate that uh, uh, solicitation uh, uh, mentioned about uh, uh, biodiversity in the uh, criteria indicator for biophysical. Uh, of uh, peatland restoration. And uh, I think uh, uh, what Pa uh, Solisin proposed is uh, ideal condition for the uh, for ecological, uh, natural con uh, ecological condition in uh, peatland. Uh, but uh, uh, usually we are, in, in uh, peatland restoration in Asia, we also have to uh, consider uh, other, uh, not only natural and climax, uh, climax uh, uh, tree species uh, planted in uh, peatland restoration, but also uh, tree species which are benefit for uh, uh, community who live uh, surrounding the area. Uh, and I also uh, thank for the uh, Amikbal who already uh, uh, respond and Pa Solisin also, also respond in my uh, comment. Yes, thank you. Thank you, pa Daniel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice to hear your voice anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Again, uh, someone is applauding the uh, issue of having water even in dry season. Uh, Sam, are you still there? Would you like to share your concern on hydrology and runoff and everything? 
Are you still there, Sam? Please turn your microphone on. Thanks, Daniel. I am still there. And um, yeah, great to um, hear all the different ideas about biophysical indicators. I was writing in the chat in response to the second speaker, Hofik, about soil moisture being too difficult for community users to measure, to easily measure or without special training or expensive equipment. And I just wanted to highlight that this has been an issue of great concern, particularly in irrigated systems in Africa. And I put a link in the chat to the chameleon card system and the Via Farm website, which is a soil moisture measuring system, which is specifically designed for community users. So it just has, doesn't have, you know, it does have numbers behind it, but it has a color based, three color based indicator system. And we've been trialing it in, um, in central Kalimantan in tropical peats and found that it looks really promising. Um, and this is, this is ongoing work that um, I think Laura Graham from BOSS is also in the session here and it's an ACR funded project. So there, there are definitely technical options for community to easily measure soil moisture, either on a spot, you know, either seasonally, just a couple of times a year, or on a more monitoring kind of ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Look forward to release your chameleon somewhere else. <laughs> so I'll send you one, this. Daniel. We'll send you one. <laughs> All right. Any, anybody want to respond on the questions and concern from the audience, from the three panel as well as uh, Mark as discussion? We still have plenty of time, 10 more minutes to go. I should be agile enough to look at the chat, but uh, that's the most I can capture, but feel free if you want to throw anything uh, so that we can discuss it and enrich what we've been learning. Uh, I see in the floor, yeah, many people from different parts of the world and Italy and Germany, Australia, Korea. So let's uh, make use of this very precious time we have together. Malaysia, Singapore, yeah. Any other comments or questions? All right, if not, I would like to ask Mark again. Um, he has the task to really wrap up what we've been discussing in this uh, breakout group. And uh, Mark, uh, you have a lot of concern and critical questions um, contrasting between reliability and accuracy, hierarchy and those kind of stuff. I wonder if you can um, tell us what is your, uh, what do you find here since we were discussing this um, in your plenary session as well as in your uh, breakout group here? <laughs> Yeah, so this uh, could be quite useful because I uh, have another commitment. I'm actually running a training uh, course for okay. uh, the Global Peat Leaves Initiative at, uh, uh, in, in 10 minutes I need to, to be gone. So I <laughs> won't be able to do this in plenary. So I'll give you uh, my thoughts now and hopefully Daniel um, uh, or others uh, can, uh, can represent that to the wider group. Um, so the two things that uh, that I I pulled out of the of the talks, um, linking back to the concerns uh, or uh, critiques that, that I gave of this whole uh, of this whole area in my plenary talk, um, was first of all this trade off between accuracy and ease of use. Uh, in the paper that I linked to, uh, there's a table there with much more uh, detail on the kind of criteria you might use to judge whether an indicator is indeed accurate and is indeed easy enough uh, to, uh, to be used. 
Um, and uh, we pulled out the idea uh, of, uh, of seasonality uh, and the need for time series data, but also uh, recognition of the, the potential misuse of indicators that have to be used at particular times of years or in particular locations, um, which can then affect the reliability uh, of, uh, of an indicator that in itself is very accurate. Uh, so accuracy and reliability don't necessarily go together depending on how accurate indicator is actually applied and used. Um, I think that, uh, so the question that I then posed was, uh, was which of these uh, indicators might be measured uh, easily by uh, local communities. And we heard that uh, peak depth is something that can be very easily measured, uh, various ways in which uh, water table depth might be measured, uh, two very important indicators. Uh, a concern expressed, though, that of course we can't only rely on this. Um, it's, uh, it might be useful for engaging, inspiring, uh, connecting communities. Uh, and if well designed, it might be a useful adjunct to our scientific monitoring programs. Uh, but to do that, we're going to have to have clearly uh, designed uh, and uh, laid out and trained uh, protocols so everyone knows what they're doing. Um, they need to be very simple, easy to use in terms of the technology, technology the kind of equipment that uh, people have to hand. And ideally, you need to be doing this over a comparable network of sites. Uh, so it's not just we've got one village who's interested and they're doing it. Great, that can have benefits for them. But in terms of inputting to the science, we need to actually have a, a well-designed set of, of sites that we would be collecting that data across. The second uh, question that I put to you all was uh, around this uh, this hierarchy, um, and uh, Hans Houston made the, the point that uh, this should be about the science and it should not be about politics. Uh, however, he also said that, um, that we need to be uh, measuring goals, and it is those goals that are ultimately uh, the domain of politics. And depending on who you are, whether you're a conservationist, a, a climate uh, policy person or whatever, you will have different goals and you will want to prioritize different indicators. So in terms of, of any hierarchy, uh, that hierarchy will depend on the goal, uh, which will depend on the audience and the purpose for which someone wants monitoring data. Uh, but if we wanted to, to generalize, um, uh, the, uh, the, I think that the key thing that, that come, came out of the discussion was the idea that, uh, that hydrological um, indicators uh, are the most foundational because of the way in which they then drive um, uh, climatic and, and biodiversity indicators. Is that a fair summary? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's one of your time. And I uh, wish you have a, a good time in your next session somewhere else. And uh, really thank you, Mark, for your efforts uh, since uh, this morning or earlier session. Um, colleagues, if you still have something burning, uh, feel free. We, we have five minutes. But what Mark has been describing and summarizing really are the thing that we, we need to think about in, in the plenary. We will be sharing what we've been thinking about the the vegetation, uh, the um, biomass and, and biodiversity, uh, the hydrology, the, the, the climate uh, system, seasonality, and those kind of stuff are really biophysical that, well, in, in as far as criteria is concerned, they are neutral. We just name it hydrology. We, we don't uh, feel like, you know, being positive or being negative about it, but in the indicators, we, we should be able to indicate uh, whether this is something useful to have more water or less water and then we have the measurement and um, uh, Pahiri in the plenary session mentioned about fairy fire that that's more sophisticated and perhaps uh, higher tiers not level in terms of the accuracy whether we can afford it to do so or is it reliable enough to uh, adopt uh, that's that's the challenge in in the context of uh, testing this criteria and indicator in the future or near future. And then fire, as, as I said earlier, is this very sensitive issue, but we know it is very important in the field with regard to the dryness and wetness and this kind of thing in the peat as well as in the uh, climate system. And this is very much related to what Mark called as goal or political criteria or indicator or principle, whatever, 
but this is much, much higher than what we are thinking as, as scientists, as a practitioner. And uh, I think uh, that will be overarching issue that uh, we cannot certainly uh, put in any kind of cluster here. Maybe that's the issue that uh, in the opening uh, plenary, uh, the head of BRG mentioned about the progressiveness. Maybe in the future, carbon is no longer an issue, but uh, the community more, much more concerned about their livelihood or the local government more concerned about their livelihood. They might be less important in terms of carbon uh, emission reduction in the future, I don't know. So let's be open on this agenda. And um, certainly we've been learning a lot in terms of identifying what we know, what we do not know, and what we need to know more in the future. So um, I think, unless you have burning questions, I would like to, to uh, stop there and we can move back to the plenary room while I'm tidying up my notes <laughs> to, to share with the other group. <laughs>